Greetings, Kerbonauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number one of Project Alexandria. And Kerbonauts, the world is flat. Oh, and also all of the planets and the stars and our sun revolve around the Earth. Or at least that's what people used to think until Nicholas Copernicus, who published a book called On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres in 1543. In this book, he challenged Ptolemy's geocentric system and offered an alternative, suggesting that the sun was the center of our solar system and that all of the planets revolved around it. At around the same time, four to six hundred years ago, during the Ming Dynasty, legend has it that Wan Hu was the first human astronaut after attaching rockets to the bottom of his chair, lighting them, and proceeding to ascend into the heavens. The Mythbusters did an episode in which they tried to replicate the Wan Hu legend, and their attempts went about as well as my recreation of the event. So, there used to be a TV show I watched when I was a kid called Connections with James Burke, and I really liked his format. He would describe an event or a person that influenced something in history, which in turn influenced something or someone else, and so on, until eventually it would lead to a connection that you could never have imagined. The connections that bind the history of spaceflight are a little less esoteric and should be much easier to follow. Poor Wan Hu, his flight isn't going so well. We'll get to some more Kerbal replicas real soon, but before we can do that, we need to look at how we got to the beginning of spaceflight history, and my story begins with Copernicus and his heliocentric theory. It was roughly 30 years after his publication when Johannes Kepler, who surely read Copernicus, described his laws of planetary motion. The first one is that an orbit of a planet is an ellipse, with the sun as one of the two foci. Number two, a line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time, which basically just means you go really fast at your periapsis and slower at your apoapsis. Number three, the square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. In other words, a bunch of complicated math, but it's important because 70 years after Kepler, Sir Isaac Newton was born in December of 1642, and when he was 45 years old, he would publish Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica, in which he would describe what would become the Newtonian laws of motion. These you should know. Number one is inertia. An object at rest will remain at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. And an object in motion continues in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Number two is about force, and an acceleration is produced when a force acts on a mass, and the greater the mass, the greater the amount of force needed. And number three is important with rockets, and that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. But he also included a derivation of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. And these works would connect to William Moore over a hundred years later when in 1813 he would publish the Treatise on the Motion of Rockets and first described the rocket equation. Newton and Moore helped create a world where science was interesting, celebrated, and most of all, allowed. About 50 years later, their works inspired people like Jules Verne, who wrote From the Earth to the Moon in 1865. He tells the story of the Baltimore Gun Club building a cannon that can fire three humans to the moon, with math that was surprisingly close to reality for having such a lack of data back then. Roughly 30 years forward from there, Jules Verne links to H.G. Wells, who wrote The War of the Worlds in 1898. And these works then link us to Konstantin Tsiolkovsky five years later and Robert H. Goddard. 
Tsiolkovsky independently developed the rocket equation in Russia and published The Exploration of Cosmic Space by Means of Reaction Devices. Meanwhile, Robert Goddard was working on the first liquid-fueled rockets and filed a few patents for such in 1914. Five years later, he'd also publish A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes, which discussed solid and liquid-fueled rocketry. Meanwhile, in Russia, Tsiolkovsky founded the Society for Studies of Interplanetary Travel in the Soviet Union in 1924. Despite being ridiculed throughout his rocketry career for his ideas that were way ahead of their time, in 1926, Goddard launched the world's first liquid-fueled rocket. It was on the 16th of March in 1926 in a field in Auburn, Massachusetts, which actually isn't that far away from where I was born and raised for the first 18 years of my life at least. I grew up not far away, about a 50 minute drive down the highway from there. Hopefully Goddard's launch attempts went a lot better than mine did throughout the years because KSP was definitely not enjoying the little teeny parts I was using, the scaled down things, different part masses that were minuscule compared to the things that I'll be launching when we get into the Apollo era. But the thing is, I wanted to make this identical to the scale of the first real rocket that Goddard launched, and so therefore I have to use these tiny little bits. You can see I have his little launch pyramid there and the rocket in the middle that would be attached up at the top until it started to go, and then that would let loose and the rocket would continue on. Interestingly, his early rockets had the nozzle at the top of the rocket with an asbestos cap to protect the fuel tank at the bottom. He did that because he thought it would be more stable, but he quickly learned that it would not be more stable, and so he quickly switched to having the nozzle at the base of the rocket, which is of course how we still launch even today. The Kerbal at the beginning of this video gave you a sense of the scale for it, but remember Kerbals are much shorter than humans too. Our next link goes from Goddard to Hermann Oberth in Germany. Oberth was a physicist who gained extraordinary fame and publicity in Germany by being a consultant on various projects, including a silent film titled The Woman on the Moon. Oberth and Goddard discussed their projects at first, but later Goddard would accuse Oberth of plagiarism and become more secretive about his own work. And five years after Goddard, Oberth launched his first liquid rocket in 1929. Oberth was also a teacher and one of his students was Werner von Braun, who in 1933 began work on a large rocket design called the A-Series. By 1942, one of von Braun's test rockets crossed the Kármán line and entered into space. Engineer and physicist Theodore von Karman had calculated that at about 100 kilometers above sea level, an airplane going fast enough to produce enough lift to stay in the air would actually reach orbital velocity. So now 100 kilometers is the internationally recognized delimiter between atmosphere and space, as well over 99% of our air is below that line. We'll begin here in the VAB taking a look at it and then we will launch it. You can see that I have created a sort of launch tower structure here on the side of it. The, theoretically, the personnel working at the launch site would be able to go up that ladder right there, up into here and hook up fuel lines or whatever is necessary to run over into there. The rocket was 14 meters roughly from down here all the way up to the tip where we have our warhead there. If we pull off the actual launch tower, you can see that I have it at 12.805 tons, which as far as I can tell, was the mass of the V2. Although there are a lot of different stats on the V2, some of them have it at one mass, some at another, some at one thrust on the engine, some at a different thrust. I think it's because it went through various incarnations over the years because after the war was over, the German scientists were split up. Some went to Russia, some went to the United States, and they continued working on it, and they took some of their ideas and they rebuilt the V2 in America. And so some of the stats might be related to that sort of a thing. Anyway, let's take a look at what's going on inside the V2. You can see that I have my warhead here, but inside there is the explosives. These are representing the explosives 
with the arming pin up here as well as amatol down in there. If we pull the side off, you can see that I have all of my avionics and uh, communications, gyroscope, all up in there. Sliding down a little bit, we can see right here that we have our fuel tank. Up on the top, I have a fuel tank filled with ethanol 75, and down here, we have the liquid oxygen. And then moving down to look inside the engine area, you can see I have my engine down there. Got the fins out here on the outside, as well as some more of the engine parts all up in here. So there's one good last look at it before we take it out onto the launch pad and send it on its way. And here we are. Unfortunately, we are in Florida because my install has become very unstable. I wouldn't say it has become unstable. It becomes unstable if I try to move my rocket to a different launch pad, like say over to Germany where it ought to be. And so I have to launch from here if I want to be able to really launch it. Oh well, maybe I can find some way to switch my launch pad to other locations without crashing at some point in the future if I were to continue this. For now, we'll launch from Florida and we will pretend that we're launching from Germany across into England, which is exactly what happened in the September of 1944. That's when the retaliation for bombing against German cities began by sending thousands of these V2 rockets across the channel and into England. Mostly they were dumped down onto London, destroying all kinds of buildings. They were very inaccurate though. Thousands of civilians were killed, but it really didn't have that much of an impact on the military. It ended up only serving as a tool for terror and was an enormous waste of resources in terms of trying to win the war. It cost more to develop the V2 than it did for the United States to develop the atomic bomb. The war ended before the rocket program could be advanced to something more promising and maybe lead to some sort of a victory or at least a military success. But though it didn't advance Germany, it did lead to significant advances in the United States and the Soviet Union as the German scientists were scooped up by the two sides after the war. A significant portion of the V2 team ended up working at Redstone in the United States Army, including von Braun himself. 1500 meters per second, 90 kilometers altitude, 300 kilometers downrange distance. Going faster than the speed of sound, they would strike the ground with no warning. You'd hear the explosion before you heard the rocket. At the same time that Olberth and von Braun were, had been working on rockets in Germany, independent advances were being made in the Soviet Union. Linking back through Tsiolkovsky, Sergei Korolev was working on the first liquid-fueled rockets in the Soviet Union, and the first was launched in August of 1933, around the same time that von Braun was starting the A-series in Germany. But Soviet advances were hampered by the government at that time, most notably by Kurilov's imprisonment in a gulag for several years during World War II, and it's said he was always afraid of being executed to protect against the leak of the military secrets he knew. Then the war ended in 1945, and the U.S. and the USSR knew very well by then how important rocketry development was going to be, so it was a race to snap up the German scientists. Von Braun helped the cause by gathering his staff and asking them which side they wanted to go to, the USSR or the U.S. They decided to surrender to America, and after considerable effort and several injuries, many finally managed to get themselves into American hands. Von Braun eventually went to White Sands in New Mexico, and with some captured V-2s, he continued his work there. The U.S. had won the war with Japan by dropping two atomic bombs, and the obvious next step was to be able to put radioactive bombs on rockets. So in 1946, with captured V-2 rockets, the U.S. was beginning to work on intercontinental ballistic missiles. But first, in May of 1946, the U.S. launched the first rocket that went above 80 kilometers and later that year uh, sent another that went over 100 kilometers and took several pictures from space for the very first time. In 1947, the first animals were launched into space. 
Fruit flies. Meanwhile, in the USSR, Korolev was continuing his advances as well. I'll come back to him in a moment because this is where the story splits into two halves. American scientists were working on the redstone in White Sands at the same time that the Soviets were independently working on the R-series rockets in the Soviet Union, eventually leading to the development of the R-7. First we'll look at the redstone and then at the R-7 Semyorka. In 1954, von Braun proposed the Project Orbiter, which was to put a satellite on a redstone rocket and send it into orbit. This involved notable names like Hans Geiger, who you know from having invented the Geiger counter, and James Van Allen, who the Van Allen radiation belt is named after. So here you can see me doing my first couple test launches of an actual redstone replica. I have all of the details all figured out now. The very first attempt had a slight issue with the effects module. Nothing was coming out of the engine, so I decided to just cut the throttle and that's why it fell back down onto the pad and exploded. Which I'm sure, being only that it was one failure, is way fewer failures than what the United States really had. My second attempted launch here isn't going so bad, and you can see that I've actually been able to get it up fairly high, almost out of the atmosphere. The real redstone early on probably wasn't doing much better than what my replica here is doing. It didn't have a huge range at this point, and it wasn't capable of going into orbit or sending any sort of payload into orbit. But then on its way back into the atmosphere, I was having a little bit of a problem with it burning up. So I still need to work on its heat shield there, uh, or maybe it's just my deadly re-entry is too strong. I'll have to investigate to see which it is. So here's my redstone in the VAB, and you can see it's not really that super complicated. I have an actual redstone clamp down at the bottom to hold it into place. And then we have down here these little fins that give it its attitude control. They're kind of cool because take a look at that right there. You can see it has an air fin, but over on this side, it also has a thrust fin. So when they fit on there like this, you can see that as the flames come out, they go past this thrust plate here, and that gives it additional attitude control. So those are attached here to this engine piece, which then goes up to the fuel tank. And then I have my sort of heat shielded nose cone there with the warhead underneath and then just a basic CPU. There's not really anything else going on with this one, but rockets back then just weren't that complicated. I'm not sure exactly how closely I've gotten this to match real life, but hopefully it's really close. You can see that I've got it here at 27, almost 28 tons gross launch mass with a 1.28 thrust to weight ratio right there. Its total delta V is pretty low, you can see, but as I said earlier, they didn't really have a huge range anyway, so that's probably realistic. Once again, I'm crafting all of my own parts using models that come out of other parts. So I have set this one up to be the engine right here with uh, the different ISPs that I think are probably right. and. It uses ethanol and liquid oxygen, which I believe is the correct fuel, and in the correct fuel mixtures and everything. I probably won't go too in-depth into this sort of stuff in most of the future rockets, just suffice it to say that every time you see me building anything, probably all of the parts have been handcrafted to be precisely like the real thing. So after making some small changes, I have taken it back out for another test launch. This time I want to look very closely at the deadly reentry settings and look at the temperatures as it goes. You can pull up that deadly reentry dialog box I have there by holding down Alt, D, and R at the same time. And then when you click on the part, you're able to look at extra information on that part about how it's doing with the deadly reentry variables, looking at the temperatures and things like that. And once again, inadvertently simulating reality, I am burning up on my re-entry, which is exactly the same problem that the real rockets had. Sometimes they would break up while they were coming back into the atmosphere. 
The next iteration after the redstone was the Jupiter C. And you can see I've been in here measuring it. I have these panels that I made. That is one piece. I made it out of uh, five regular structure panels and then I welded the panels together into one piece so that I could use them for a nice easy measuring stick. So often what I'll do is I'll put, since these are one meter each, I'll put this here like that and then I can attach things to the bottom and move them around like this and get an idea. So now that I know that right there is five meters long and I can measure this fuel tank or the whole thing overall by simply taking this and putting it on like that. And we can look and see, oh look, five, 10, 15 meters. So about 21 meters tall was the Jupiter C. And so the panels let me ensure that I'm getting the right distances and the right diameters and everything like that on these. Now this one I'm building up to start looking a little bit like the Explorer launcher, but a Jupiter C basically looked like that where it had its payload up on the top, but was otherwise very similar to a Redstone rocket. It has a, the same engine at the bottom, although it has a little bit more thrust than it did previously. The fuel tank is bigger. I'm actually right now in the middle of setting these still. See, the, the original pieces showed liquid fuel and oxidizer, and I'm switching them over to use uh, different fuels, the proper fuels, which in this case is gonna be Hydine and liquid oxygen. The Jupiter C, instead of using Ethanol 75, it switched to Hydine. Hydine is a mixture of unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine and diethylenetriamine which is probably just another fancy way of saying super toxic. So when it came to the practice of actually using the Hydine, they decided that it was way too toxic and later reverted back to using the Ethanol 75. But in this case, I'm going to hook this up to using the Hydine for my next test. And here is that next test. As you can see, I've already skipped ahead to where it started to flip out. I'm still launching from Florida as well. Later in the development here of Project Alexandria, I have finally figured out how to switch my launch pad to different locations around the world. So we will be seeing that in some of the future launches. At this point, I hadn't figured it out yet. And the way that I work on it is I kind of take a stab at a problem. And if I don't get a solution immediately, I might go and do something else and come back to the problem later after I've done some additional research or whatever. And in this case, that's what I've been doing. I'll work a little bit on a rocket and then I'll work a little on my in Install, or I'll try to fix one of the visual effects and then I'll go work on one of the mass values and I kind of jump around doing various things as I slowly develop the whole install and slowly build up all of the parts. So in history, we're around 1955 right now, and around this time period, Von Braun was becoming quite a celebrity. He was going on TV as the foremost space expert in America. He was part of promotions by Disney, such as the opening of Tomorrowland in 1955. He was also featured on several Disney TV shows like Man and the Moon, where he described his concept for a space station. He was also part of the announcement by President Eisenhower that the U.S. was committed to launching an artificial satellite by 1957. It was in 1956 that these Jupiter C launches that you've been seeing me try uh, started for the first time in the United States. I've been experimenting with trying to get the fuel mixture right and getting the proper altitude. I was also intrigued in this particular instance and why I watched it in the orbital view at seeing how even though we had gone straight up in the air and had this trajectory that was taking us way out in front, when we came back down again because the planet is rotating under us, we actually fell down back here close to the coast. And then I was able to get it into New Mexico. This is a new launch site that I added myself because it's not in the normal real solar system install. So I figured out how to add them and how to get them to work without crashing my game. And now you can see here we're launching our next Jupiter C test from White Sands, New Mexico in the United States. But as I said, this was all going on at the same time as the independent advances in the Soviet Union. And then in 55, Eisenhower made his announcement. The Soviets countered this declaration by also declaring that they could put a satellite into orbit and that they would beat the Americans to it. So in 1955, the Soviet government established the Baikonur Cosmodrome. In 1956, von Braun got Oberth to come and join his team. And by the way, Oberth would live long enough to see space shuttles launch, which was pretty cool for him, I bet. And in 57, the USSR created the first ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, known 
R7 Sembiorca, or to NATO it was known as the SS6 Sapwood. You're taking a look right now at one of my test launches of the Sembiorca, and I'm actually launching from the Baikonur Cosmodrome as well. Now, I didn't have them coming from here at the very, very beginning. Initially, I was still doing some of my early tests out of Florida because I hadn't figured out how to move the launch site yet. Well, this is one of those early launch tests, and it was pretty funny. The extra voice is my son, who was with me at the time. Davies. Is the warhead okay? I think it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the launch clamps are fine. <laughs> oh, except for one. One poor launch clamp. <laughs> one clamp. The warhead's... Oh, the warhead! No! Oh! Oh, it's <laughs> oh, the warhead! <laughs> it survived! Okay. We can put that in a new rocket. Yeah. This shouldn't be too bad. <laughs> <laughs> you can see my initial R7 Samyorka here in the VAB. This is still very much a work in progress, and this won't be 100% right at this point. As you can imagine, the data that I have available to me for something that came out of the Soviet Union during the Cold War is a little bit on the sparse side still. But I've done my best. I believe it's still a little bit light at 264 tons. It's probably still missing about 15 tons worth of mass on there, which for all I know might be why it's not going as far as I think it should. I probably need to add some more fuel to this. If you want to see some of the parts that we have going on in here, we've got these little Vernier thrusters right here that were used in order to get attitude control. There are two of them on each of the engines that are around the outside. Those are the four engines that go around on the boosters. You can see here that these operate off kerosene and liquid oxygen. They have a thrust of 74 or 744.5 at sea level. For this version that I'm doing right now, ISPs of 250 to 306 but they don't have any gimbal. You see they're 0%, which is why they had those two little verniers on each of these initial boosters. Now when those separate and fly off on the side there, then we're left with this core right through the middle here. And the core has on it one RD108 engine. The ones on the outside were the 107s. The 108 comes with four vernier rockets on it to give it attitude control. It has a slightly lower thrust at 617, but a slightly higher vacuum ISP at 308. Then that core booster runs up through here in the middle here, loaded with kerosene and liquid oxygen, going all the way up until we reach our warhead. Since this was technically supposed to be an intercontinental ballistic missile, I have a warhead on there, and then this is what I'm using for my avionics. I'm not 100% sure yet whether or not this whole booster here would come down as one piece or whether the warhead would decouple and come in separately. I still haven't uh, found that information. So for the moment, I have this where the warhead is just on there and then this uh, cap, the nose cone, goes on there to protect the warhead during re-entry. Uh, although I wasn't technically really re-entering very well. Oh my goodness, look at this. I have a NASA flag down here on the side. I should have a Soviet Union flag or something, but I don't think I have one installed. Well, like I said, there are a lot of things that still aren't 100% set up, and that is one of them. Uh, hopefully I will remember to do things that are cool, like putting proper country flags on different launches based on what they are. Uh, but uh, don't kill me if I forget and accidentally have some default NASA flag flag or something loaded. So here we are once again going back in time a little bit, back to before I had figured out how to get it launching from the Cosmodrome. Also at this point I still don't have any smoke coming out of the boosters, which I still need to get fixed up, and I don't have any clouds because currently the real solar system install, the visual enhancements do not work with the 0.25, but as soon as those are available I will install that mod and we will have clouds. Until then, I'm afraid we're not going to have it. 
As you can imagine, blowing up right there was a bit of a shock to me. I had too much thrust on the separation rockets that throw the initial boosters away from the core. And then here we've moved back into the Baikonur Cosmodrome, but the fuel mixture wasn't quite right. The engines were accidentally set to use ethanol and the whole thing got quite bouncy and explodable. However, I did save the warhead once again. Later I would get it to launch correctly, but since the mass values may not be right still, I think it isn't going as far as it should be. I was giving it a try to see how it would go. Since the shortest distance between the Soviet Union and the United States would be a line that I think goes more over the North Pole area, that's the direction that I'm trying to fly. However, it doesn't quite make it far enough, and on its way back into the atmosphere, it just burns up and explodes. So once again, I'm still trying to figure out how to get those deadly reentries set to be a little bit more realistic. So we began this episode with the V2 rocket, and now I have it launching from Penumbra because that's where they were actually being developed, and I have the ability to create launch sites of my own. So I created one for Penumbra, and these tests were coming out of there. Then we started looking at the redstone rocket, and due to some kind of glitch, it wasn't actually lifting off right here. So it had invertedly turned into a static fire test, I guess, and ultimately ended up with uh, some really weird glitch where when it exploded, we just zipped off into space, and uh, it just kept on going and going and going. I had to reboot KSP after that one. We got a chance to look at the Jupiter C, building, testing, launching out of White Sands, New Mexico. I even did a little experimentation so far with the payload, seeing how the little boosters up there work, how the payload can get inserted into the orbit that it's going to need to be when I do the Explorer 1 satellite in a future episode. I didn't show this one in the VAB, but it's essentially a redstone with a slightly larger fuel tank and some place to put a payload. And finally, we had a chance to look at the R7 Samyorka launching, well, testing at this point in my game out of the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Soviet Union, which will of course later be Baikonur out of Kazakhstan. The R7 was the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile, and it was thus that in the late 1950s, the Cold War between the US and the USSR was kicked off and the space race began. In the next episode, we will continue from 1957 and the launch of Sputnik along with various other space launches. This has been Project Alexandria. Until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.